I can show you them. <gasps> ah! Whoa. I hicked up. Pens for sweaty hands. There yeah. you go. That should be the I feel title. like I'm very qualified to answer that one. You notice I did not write anything into the... <laughs> no you, notes on that you one. You knew I would have that one covered. <laughs> I knew you'd have that one covered. All right. You ready to go? In sweat. Yes. Cool. Yeah, All we right. Can... Let's jump right into it. Jump ahead. Okay. <laughs> hey, everybody. Brian Goulet here. And this is episode number 18 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm here with Drew Brown. I'm breaking format. Hi. I'm breaking format a little bit. <laughs> I just, you know what? I was looking at my old Q&A notes, and I just started launching into my old Q&A intro. How as soon that? as you said your name, I'm like, Crap. oh boy, here yep. we go. We're going to... We're going to... Classic Brian form. <laughs> Brian writes the script. Brian doesn't read the script. <laughs> Brian improvises. This is how all the videos go. Anyway... You're doing great. We are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about underrated inks, sheening and shading and what causes them, and pens for sweaty hands. So hold the phone, all you sweaty handed people. <laughs> I'm going to get to share my experiences there. Anyway, let's start out with some feedback, shall we? All right, Brian. You know what? Once again, I have a theme for my section of the feedback. Look at you. And it's aliens. Aliens. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Alien theme. Okay. So first things first, I was accused of being uh, abducted by aliens last week because I wore a more casual than normal shirt um i thought the episode was yeah i thought it seemed a little quieter in that episode it was po it had so dots we were, all over we, it we weren't, having a, we weren't having a yell over top of your loud shirt yeah i guess not so anyway <laughs> someone someone thought i had been abducted by aliens and replaced with uh, a drew that wore normal looking shirts so not only that but another person said that your suspiciously circular hand wound mm. brian was the work of extraterrestrials Oh. A la a la crop circle, I'm guessing. So interesting. Um, it is healing. Then, it is healing, but it's still there. It's still yeah. But whatever they implanted into your wrist still is circle. still there. Yeah. yeah, it's not really my yeah. wrist. It's like in the palm of my hand. Oh, yeah. well, well, either either way, they're gonna come back for that at some point. Fair enough. Um, and then uh, it was confirmed that the we were talking about the Lamy dialogue, <laughs> the big dialogue, the dialogue three, and how it looked kind of like a Men in Black memory eraser. That's right. Uh, we were told that it is called the Neuralizer, mm. and it is indeed silver. And I believe, ah, okay, I believe that's what I said, but I don't remember. I think, I think you were right. Yeah, I think that's what you said. You know more about movies and things than I do. So that was. But either way, that's three yeah. alien centric comments. How so about that? How about that? There we go. Appropriately themed. Thank well you very done. much. Um, you may have noticed that we have new music this week as we had last week. Um, we're just kind of trying some new things out. We wanted to inject a little bit of personality into the tunes. Um, this was something that we had uh, commissioned for the show, so it is our tune um, requisitioned by us. So uh, some feedback we got after last week was that it was a bit cheesy. Yes, it is meant to have sort of a retro uh, vibe to it. So we're kind of going for that. So... Um, Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, we also got a lots of good feedback, so uh, we appreciate that. And we also heard at least one person say it was a little too loud during the transitions of us going into a new segment. We're going to work on that. We can get that fixed. Easy, yeah. no problem. So yeah. uh, continue to let us know what you think. We're probably not going to change it, so don't bother saying you should change it because we'll just ignore you on that one. But uh, <laughs> any other feedback is welcomed. <laughs> Wonderful. I love how you cater the feedback, like very specifically. Only tell us the things that we want to hear. But of that feedback, please Pretty give much. as please give as much Pretty as you much. like. <laughs> fair enough. Yes. I mean, yeah. To be fair, the music is a little cheesy. That's kind of what we were going for. So nailed it. Yeah. Not full on cheese. We didn't want like five cheese pizza cheese. Yeah, we're, we're talking like serious, serious cheese, like nice cheese, quality cheese, because that's what yeah. we do here. That's what we do here. We we have a, a, a very mix of seriousness and uh, cheese. So uh, there you go. Fitting. And then uh, along the theme of our audience educating us because we don't actually know much of what we're talking about. Um, 
pretty much anything outside of pens. Pens, we like have a pretty good sense, but other things, it gets it gets uh, out of hand real quick. Uh, so we did find that barnacles are indeed crustaceans. Um, so uh, Tess commented that uh, I would buy Barney the barnacle for every pen I own and every person I know get on that. So um, do you remember what that was in reference to, Brian? Um, to be honest with you, I mean, the barnacle you, was like you, the 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 little crustacean that's on the end of the yeah. the nib when you're you, your you, ink you had had you had had so, you had said something like uh, said, yeah, you invented we need like a a character like a, a yeah, brand yeah, yeah, icon yeah 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 you came up with the idea of some merch and you invented Barney the, bar- <laughs> the Barney the barnacle Barney the barnacle yeah <laughs> I don't know what Barney would look like probably not very appealing I don't think barnacles uh, are particularly attractive creatures but you know. Hey, we could work on something. I'm sure we could figure we something could, out. Yeah, we could figure something out. Yeah, we'll 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 we'll, we'll look into that, Tess. Uh, Amy said, "I'm having so much fun listening to this with a cup of coffee. I feel like I'm sitting down with fellow pen lovers for a great and fun conversation. It's so awesome, especially during these times. Thanks, y'all, for the videos. That is really cool to hear because that's pretty much exactly what we're going for with this format, and it's kind of fun for us too. If you couldn't tell." Drew and I would pretty much just sit down and have fun together whether or not there's a camera on. So the fact that we record, it's just kind of a bonus. Um, Sandy says, you guys are really a breath of fresh air in these trying times. Thanks for adding humor and light. Happy to do that for you, Sandy. We need it ourselves, honestly. So sometimes we might be a little ridiculous and a little loopy and we might not listen to what the other person says and then say the exact same thing like I did like three <laughs> times in the last episode. I'm a little more with it today, so we'll see if I do it, but I don't know. We'll see. Part of the reason I actually switched my location back around is because I have fewer distractions <laughs> happening when I'm facing this direction, so I'm going to see if I do any better on this episode. And last- You've got... <laughs> so the, the other way, you're looking out into your living room where you're family is out and about and doing things right yes and Ah. my kids are doing various random activities and (laughs) lots of things to distract me yeah indeed i cannot imagine if 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 i were in that situation that would be very distracting i mean here i have squirrels pretty much i mean you've heard me comment many times about the squirrels though they're they're not they've not been as active recently the hummingbirds have pretty much gone away you know it's october here in um in virginia it's getting a little cooler and then uh isn't it october everywhere (laughs) Well, yes. <laughs> October in Virginia means it's fall, which means it's getting colder, which means no more hummingbirds. That's what I was getting at. It is October everywhere. You know, if you use the traditional 12-month calendar, maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe it's not maybe October. Maybe it's not October in your reality. You're so oh, you're so very considerate, Brian. Wow, well, yes. Um, the for the foresight is astonishing. Trying to encompass all calendar <laughs> of references. Course. Uh and then the Subin RK <laughs> says forgot to comment on last week's pod but i too have the issues with sweating too much like brian <laughs> love how this is a recurring theme and i have issues with my phone getting activated by sweaty pockets the struggle is real <laughs> this is another thing if you if it happens to be october where you are it might be better for you i've, I've been activating my phone less as it's been cooler out so yes oh <laughs> It's ridiculous. What a crazy (laughs) show. Anyway, let's move on to some new stuff, shall we? Let's talk about some pen things. Um, Let's do it. We have a new Pilot Custom 74 color, Stone Blue, which we're pretty excited about. That uh, should have launched this week by the time that this thing actually publishes. So check that out. It's a darker, like navy blue. So kind of cool. It's not uh, vastly different from the existing blue that I know and love. My classic blue, it's like a medium medium tone blue, but the, the stone blue is a little bit darker, a little more of a navy, still translucent, still got the gray grip and everything else that the rest of them have, but they're just expanding the color line. So I'm really digging that the Custom 74 is like, got kind of a assortment of colors now. It used to just be a couple and now they've really expanded over the years. Now, Brian, you said last week that you had recently acquired a pen, which doesn't happen as often anymore, so being hmm. not in the office, not being tempted by, you know, the pens floating around. But yeah. you got an orange Custom 74. I did. Are, are you going to pick up the stone gray? Um, yeah, the stone gray, blue. Stone, stone blue. blue. Stone blue. Stone I was blue. like, stone gray, is there another one? Sorry. No. no. Uh, yeah, probably. I, I, I alluded to it last week. It's like I... I haven't intentionally wanted to acquire because again, they they had what just a couple of different custom seventy fours back when we first 
picked up the brand uh, a de- over a decade ago. Um, and they've come out with colors and it's kind of just expanded over time. And I sort of unintentionally acquired the violet one when that was discontinued and now I've got the orange one and I'm like, ah, okay, I might need to pick up all the colors, especially since I love that pen. So um, it's very possible I could end up acquiring most. So yeah, um, I'm not gonna like grab a stone blue like right off the bat as soon as it comes out because I'm trying to pace myself with the pen collecting and doing a terrible job at it. But anyway, yeah, it's definitely on my radar. Uh, so anyway, same price as all the other ones, great nibs, 14 karat, soft nibs. It's just, they write so great. Not soft technically like advertise soft, but they are springy. They feel soft-ish. Anyway, um, we're uh, swapping out the Mytho K in mid-October. So this is the Mayora. We have talked about this one a couple of times and we had the gold nib version, but uh, there was, I guess, more interest in the steel nib version. We thought that the gold nib would have more interest and we were wrong. So apparently the steel nib version has had more interest. So we are acquiring that one, it's less expensive. Pen body is similar. So that one's kind of cool. Um, I think that one's a cartridge converter, right? Instead of the piston drew. So mm-hmm. you're you're losing the piston, you're gonna steal instead of a gold nib, but everything else basically is the same. I don't think it has an ink window because it's not piston. Um, so a little bit of tweaks there, but the, the main bulk of the pen is largely similar. So 236 for that um, um, steel nib version. So yeah, still a great look, good fit and finish, all that. So curious to see how those go over. And then the big thing that we've had this week has been the Diamine ink vent calendars, which we did not have last year because COVID just wrecked everything. This year we did have them. So technically it's only the second one we've had because we had the you know original two years ago and didn't have one last year. And now we have one this year. So we did launch it on Tuesday this week. It's like a one-shot deal, so I don't know, actually, by the time that we publish this, whether we'll still have them or not. But if we do, definitely go pick it up as soon as you can if you're interested, because once they're gone, they are gone. And I believe that's probably going to be the case with most retailers. I think they just they have a certain number of them, and they've shipped them all out. And anybody who got them probably got them in a single shipment, at least in the U.S. I don't know how they're handling in other parts of the world, but... Um, probably similarly. So, um, yeah. So if you're not familiar with what that is, um, it's what $110, I think drew. And it's basically, uh, a, it's like a big box yeah, around there. Yeah, it's a big box set and it has 25 different bottles of ink. So it's got little sample bottles for the 24. It's an, it's an, if you're familiar with what an advent calendar is basically every day in December, you open up one of these little compartments inside this big box of a calendar and it's got different ink colors every single day. So it's like a nice little surprise that you get to have. We intentionally did not put color swatches of the actual ink colors on our site. It's out there on the internet if you want to go and search and find from other people that have leaked it. But um, yeah, if you're interested in that, you can go check it out. It's kind of a cool experience, especially if you want to do like the actual one a day kind of thing. It's fun and there's a bunch of people that are going to have these and it'll be kind of a whole thing. So the intention is to start it in December and then you finish it on the 25th, which is Christmas, where you have a full bottle on that day. So yeah, kind of fun. So yep. And if you uh, are one of the, you know, lucky acquirers of this and you do want to do the each day, you know, ink uh, ink event calendar um, and you want to post it on Instagram or something tag us in it if you bought it from us and we can you know maybe share some and share all of the cool types of swatches everybody does for the uh, holiday season I think that'd be really neat yeah and these are new colors too these are not just like repackaged existing diamine colors some of them obviously are probably gonna be similar to things they already have but um, if it's anything like the original they're gonna be a nice variety and some shimmer some regular guess it would be a lot of fun live good good experience if you're looking for something to kind of liven up your December or if you get it soon what the heck liven up your mid-October if you really want to get into it early I mean I was at Home Depot what two days ago and they already have christmas decorations out it's like as soon as october happened it's like yeah okay whatever christmas they're like they have halloween stuff over there and christmas over here and i'm like first off thanksgiving is just like whatever but then you know here you have this like dichotomy of decorations happening there's like reindeers and santa claus over here and then like demons and witches and stuff over here with giant skeletons and inflatable i mean horror tim objects. burton made it work it's very true Maybe he's the only one that's been able to pull that off. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, what you got, Drew? Well, Brian, I had the opportunity to handle the Pilot Izumo 
um, Rodden Galaxy today. And you know the Azumo. That's a big pen that Platinum has. It's not a regular edition pen, but it's also like regular in the fact that every now and then it shows up. It's not a one and done sort of thing. It's kind of yeah. like the uh, it's kind of like Visconti's Divina. You know, it's like it's kind of regular, but also kind of not. Um, yeah, I would. You know. Yeah, I would classify more. You said Pilot at the beginning first, by the way. It is Platinum. Just oh, sorry, sorry, Platinum. Yeah, you said, but it's fine. Um, but it's I, I would consider it more like the Namiki, like Yukari Royale or the Emperor, where it's like they don't have just one like regular pen that's around it's always yeah. it's always a limited kind of special edition thing always a special thing but that's like the standard body they use for those special editions kind of thing yeah. it's and it's sort a, of like that. it's a it's a very large pen therefore it is a very good canvas for art and we've Absolutely. had we've had Urushi um Izumos before mm -hmm. this one is just a pretty much black bodied pen mm -hmm. but covered with tiny, tiny, tiny little specks of Rodden to simulate a star field, you know, mm -hmm. the whole galaxy thing. So it's just covered in them, um, varying sizes, various depths. It does have a richness to it. It's not just kind of like right there on the surface. It does have some smaller ones lower into the lacquer and some larger ones higher up. So it does have a really fun, pretty unique depth to it. Mm. Um, but it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a pricey pen. It's about two thousand two hundred dollars. <laughs> So it is up there, but there are uh, months and months of work that go into this. If you know anything about Arushi, these things are not uh, able to be mass produced just because of the way they are built. You know, these lacquer layers have to dry and it takes a long time for them to cure. And we're talking layers upon layers upon layers. So it's a lot of work, a lot of money to uh, uh, own one of these things. Yeah. So very cool. Um, this is also uh, launching this week. By the time this airs, it will be available. At least go check it out. Obviously, looking at the pictures is even you know if you can't get one looking at the pictures is going to be fun as well we are working on those now and on the opposite end of the uh price spectrum <laughs> we have new field notes available and those are always fun as well just like the platinum azumo comes in a variety of very special <laughs> colors and finishes there i drew i drew a parallel brian you see that well done well yes. done drew uh, this time they're going to be launching or they have launched a harvest edition. So perfect for the fall, um, perfect for just looking at the bountiful nature-y situation we have going on. We've got pumpkins, we've got apples, grapes, blueberries, and chard, if that's your thing. In fact, you will have to pick between blueberries and chard if, uh, well, you could buy both. There's going to be an A packet and a B packet. One packet has chard. One does not have chard. I mean, so there is uh, just in general, there is no choice to be made between blueberries you, and uh, chard. <laughs> oh, you go on chard, huh? No, chard is disgusting. Hey, you look like a chard guy. No, blueberries, man. I <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm devour kidding. some blueberries. <laughs> look like a chard guy. What does that even mean? <laughs> Wasn't that in Parks and that? Wasn't that in Parks and Rec? Wasn't there like yes, a, <laughs> chard bodies? Chard bodies. That's <laughs> yes. They were trying to market chard, having like <laughs> after in, hours, like oh, half naked wow. dudes dancing. Oh my god! Wow. Uh, so yeah. anyway, it's they're they're really cool. They're kind of designed after kind of vintage seed packets. I really like them. But I went to buy one the other day, Brian, and then mm. I saw the the national parks <laughs> field notes are still available, and those mm. look so good too. Those are good. Yeah. And I, and I don't need any field notes, <laughs> but I want more. Yes. They're, yeah, exactly. They're you know, mm. well, they're they're they come out with them every quarter. So yeah, you get you get plenty of them. I have, I basically keep one of every one that's come out since we started carrying them. So I have like bins of them. I'm not using them, but I just collect them because the design is just amazing. I mean, that's that's basically the reason why we carry them. The the paper is like minimally acceptable for your general fountain pen use, but if they didn't have such cool designs, there's you know they for sure wouldn't be that popular. But um, and the format's really good too, but the designs are just amazing. So yeah, and they fit perfectly into a uh, rickshaw koozie case. There you go. Look at that. Look at you at the ready, using you know what? using your own wares. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not a bad design. <laughs> no, it is not. That was actually kind of the inspiration for some of our music for this pencast too. We we're like, what if we just leaned into the synthesizer? Oh, look at you, <laughs> Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Drew designed these uh, synthscape. If you're 
not uh, if you're oh, not, we don't need uh, to go into that yes oh anyway um let's get into some q a shall we drew we shall all right so <laughs> our first question this week comes from dennis roy 23 on instagram and he simply states underrated inks is that a question or a statement? We 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 don't know. Is that a d- Dennis demand? Is, Dennis is just asserting this, and it is up to us to deduce Dennis's needs. But we're going to go All right. with just as if Dennis were requesting some of our picks for underrated inks. All right. I think we can do that. Yeah. All right. I'll get into it. Okay. So go for it. For me, um, gosh, there's there's so many. Uh, there's there's very few inks that I just like absolutely hate. So. Honestly, at this point, we have 750 some inks or whatever. I could pretty much pick any ink that we've carried in the last five years. <laughs> and I will be like, oh, I haven't really used this one that much. This is actually pretty decent. Um, so yeah, for me, that's why I love the sample thing is because you just get to try all different kinds of things. But um, so ones that I know that I've really enjoyed that don't get talked about quite as much, not necessarily ones that people dog on that I think are better. So I, I got to clarify a little bit like where some of my where some of my uh, opinions are coming from. These are ones that I think are really good, that I like a lot, that may or may not be popular, but I just think like are worth noting and ones that I've had good experiences with. Not so much ones that people dog on, but I think don't deserve the dogging. They might just be ones that people just don't bring up all that much. Um, So one is um, Urban Poussière de Lune. It's like a nice dusty purple, um, which I'm, I'm not a big purple ink, guy but the dusty purples are really good especially if you're using it on like a bright white paper like a clear fontaine paper find like a nice dustier kind of more subdued color is just a little easier on the eyes you know i do generally like bold ink colors but sometimes especially on white paper if you're using just like a bright bold punchy color it can be like just a bit much you know um so i do like that one because it's really subdued and in fact if you use that one like like a cream or an off-white paper I think it looks really good too. Then you're getting that almost like a, I don't know, any anything that's like a dustier kind of subdued color or like a like a light brown color, like a sepia tone, that looks so good on an ivory paper. You get kind of like that old world kind of look. I think you get that with a little bit of a dusty purple too. I don't know, just like kind of like a royal color, like an old world royal color, I don't know. But that Poussier de Lune's really nice, really, really good shading. And I like that one a lot. Um, Lee de Tay is another one uh, that uh, is another urban color. That's one that I think falls into that same category of that like light brown. It's, it, well, it's, it's basically named after tea. Um, and uh, this is another urban color that I just don't get, but people find it popular. It's Rui Donk. It's a dusty anchor. It's like a pale pink. It does shade really well, so I get that, but it's just not my color preference. But it always just gets so much more love than I would expect. Um, it's got a very loyal following, but still not a lot of people have really heard of it. So if that happens to be your thing, if you like rusty anchors or, yeah, rust, rusty anchors, not, did I say dusty? I might've said dusty before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how an anchor is dusty. It must not be getting used very much as an anchor because they go into water. Anyway, rusty anchor. That makes more sense. Water rusts things. Anyway, so that happens. Um, Noodler's Blue. You know, I mentioned that last week, I think. I use that. I have always loved Noodler's Blue. It's just, I mean, it's just named kind of boring. It's just named blue, you know? It's like, so things I think that have more exotic names might get a little more attention online, but it's just a great blue. So I love that one. Um, I love Robert Oster Blue Water Ice. I think there's so many mid-range blues that it's easy to get kind of lost in the crowd Um, but robert oster cool company they have just a a very low impact environmental thing that's like a really you know strong characteristic of their company Um, but that blue water ice is tremendous shading it's a little bit lighter in color than noodler's blue not quite as intense great shading though Um, and i just i really enjoy it so easy on the pen as well very easy to clean and then last one I had was Diamine Syrah. And this one's kind of a throwback because I remember like uh, a decade ago or so when Diamine came out with that color. Um, it was actually kind of Richard Bender's thing because I think he was mixing Schaefer Burgundy and something else. I can't remember what color it is, but he basically like had kind of a fountain pen network 
credit to him for mixing this kind of color. And then he, he kind of worked with Diamine and shared this out and they came out with Diamine Syrah. So props to Richard Bender for doing that. But I, I remember when that happened like a long time ago, I think we sold the business in the house at that time. But I used it and I was like, man, this is really good. And every time I revisit it, I'm like, wow, this is such a great, just kind of like wine color. It's 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 kind of dark. It has good shading, but it's not too intense. I don't know, it just strikes a really good balance for me. So those are those are some of my favorites. They're not like completely off the radar, but I just think they're really great, solid inks and worth looking at. How about you, yeah, Drew? Those are those are really good choices, and mm. I agree. I agree with all of them. Um, going along what Brian said about those kind of mid-range blues getting lost in the crowd, one I do think gets lost in the crowd is Noodler's Midway Blue. Hmm. Uh, it's got a really cool name. It's one of their V-Mail series, which has a cool kind of reverse engineered story behind them all. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very nice blue, a little bit more on the lighter side than Noodler's Blue. But if you're like me and you like to write the name of your ink on pretty much whatever you're writing, writing Midway Blue is just a fun word to write. Midway has, you know, some mm. ups and some downs in it. I really do like writing that word. And um, the Battle of Midway was, you know, if you're a history nut or, you know, a World War II nut, you know, there's that as well. So it's got a good story behind it, just like a lot of other Noodlers mm -hmm. inks do. Generally, I think that their Noodlers normal inks like red, green, blue, brown, they're all really good colors. Yeah. But, but you can usually find pretty much the same thing, but with a cooler name. And, you know, uh, th that's what I think um, Midway is. Though it is lighter than blue. I, I will say it is yeah, a shade lighter. It, it like dances into that turquoise yeah. territory. Which means it has slightly better shading, Brian. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, another one I think is underrated is Noodler's Cayenne. Uh, I love spicy food. I put mm. cayenne pepper on a lot of things, so it's kind of near and dear to me because I just like the actual spice. But Noodler's Apache Sunset is immensely popular. Noodler's Habanero, also popular, not so much as Apache, but those two get a lot of press. Cayenne is like that third you know, orangey red that doesn't get as much. Um, it's like the, it's like the so, middle child of the three. You know, it just kind of gets it lost is, but it, a little bit. It's the it's the darker of the three. So, in my opinion, if you're going to write with a larger nib, but you still do want that legendary orangish noodler's shading, cayenne mm. is the way to go. Even though it is more red than orange, mm -hmm. um, it does. Um, it's a, it's more legible if you're writing with you know a 1.1 or 1.5, whereas something like Apache, which is the lighter of the three. Um, it's it can fade out a little bit more. Um, it's not it doesn't yeah. have as much punch. Yeah, it's got a stronger yellow tone to it. Um, mm -hmm. The cayenne, like you said, is stronger on the red. I think mm -hmm. I think any of the three of these could almost if you if you use them in like a blind test, it would almost be hard to tell which of the three of them that it is if you didn't actually know. But I think the red might give it away on the cayenne. I think the yeah, I think the cayenne's <laughs> more away than habanero. Yeah, and I Apache think are. I think it's a little more distinct than the Apache and habanero. I think those two yeah. are easy to confuse with each other. And another one I wanted to mention, or another two that I wanted to mention, are the first sheening inks that I ever used. And that mm -hmm. right now, inks are being marketed as sheening inks. Right. When I first started using fountain pens and inks, that was not the case. But there were a few that did it, and the more iconic ones that I remember were Diamine, Majestic Blue, and mm. Pilot Iroshizuku Yamabudo. And Yamabudo has this funky kind of mustard sheen to it within its kind of deep magenta. Mm -hmm. And uh, Majestic Blue has that kind of classic reddish sheen to their blue ink. And this was before they did it intentionally a lot. And yeah. the, the, it was kind of like a like a secret, like, oh, this ink does this special thing if you know what to look for. So one thing, you might actually buy an ink that has sheening properties or maybe marketed as having sheening properties. You might get it home and yeah, it might do the crazy sheening, but it also might be a little bit more high maintenance on your pen. If you go back in time a little bit and go and try to use some of these OG sheeners, they're not going to be as high maintenance on your pen, but you are mm -hmm. going to get that highlighty punch of a sheen. So yeah. I highly recommend you kind of going back in time and checking out some of those old school guys. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, going back to what Brian said about the Urban inks, pretty much any of their Urban inks could potentially be underrated inks. That is a line that has been consistently high quality for, for many, many years. Their colors aren't the most vibrant and punchy, but they're good inks, just overall very good inks, well-behaved inks too. 
And I've spoken with pen makers before who say that one of the only inks that they can recommend just will not ever damage their pens is the Urban original line. Um, it's just extremely well behaved. Um, and if you uh, if you have a pen that you find might be a little bit more sensitive of the inks that we carry, that one might be the best go to. Uh, my personal favorite is uh, Vert Prey. Uh, it's a lime green. Um, I probably butchered that pronunciation, but that one's a a go-to for mine. And then finally, wrapping it up with Diamine Graphite. This was mm. one of my favorite grays. Uh, before I discovered Lexington Gray and before Diamine Earl Gray came out and overshadowed Graphite. Graphite has just the tiniest little hint of green to the gray, but it is enough of a hint that it doesn't feel like just plain old gray. So I really love that one, and uh, I think it's worth checking out. Yeah, graphite is a great color. I can attest that. It literally just looks like a pencil. Um, I think I'll, th I'll throw in an honorable mention to Noodler's Lexington Gray because it looks very similar to Diamond Graphite, but it has the waterproof properties as well. But that one does get a lot of love, so I don't know if I could really yeah. classify it as underrated. Um, but yeah, um, I think, you know, you mentioned Majestic Blue. I do love that color. That was one of my original love like deep blue colors and it's still in my favorites ink color set yeah um, and that one i don't think that that one's necessarily underrated but i think that as a sheening ink it has been left in the past yeah and it's, that's that, that's kind of why i wanted to revisit that one exactly and i think you know related to that one specifically um I think there's a couple other ink colors from different brands that are similar to it that are probably actually pretty legit underrated. Um, one of them is uh, Noodler's Ottoman Azure, mm. um, which is very- You know I like that it's one. It's very, very similar to Majestic Blue. And then Private Reserve actually has one, the Electric DC Blue. So all of those are deep blues with kind of that red sheen to it. Uh, so I think that any of those three is definitely worth consideration. And the reason those were so popular like a decade or so ago is because really the original sheening ink that got everybody all excited was the Parker Penman series, which it was a solvent-based ink. It was a whole different beast. And it was an ink that was discontinued in the mid nineties. So it was like legendary status because you basically couldn't really find it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that those three inks uh, were some of the ones that approached the heavy sheen with the deep blue that you had and specifically Parker Penman Sapphire, which was like the one that was the standout of that, that group. But there have been a lot that have come out since. I think Organic Studio Nitrogen now would be the modern Parker Penman Sapphire, you know, substitute because it's just a super duper sheener but uh yeah yeah I, there was a time where ottoman azure was like my favorite ink i love that one yeah well yeah that would, that would be a good one for you to ink up again sometimes and see if you still love it as much that's a good point i don't know if you've used that in one in a while but anyway this actually is a great segue into our next question from d88385 why do sheening inks sheen and shading inks shade great, all right well great question. how about I talk a little bit about shading, and then you can cover sheening, Brian. Sounds like a plan. Because I don't really know what sheening is. But shading, anyway, is basically just the balance of dye versus water. If you've got a ton of dye and not a lot of uh, you know water, it's not going to shade as much. If you've got a little bit more water and uh, maybe a little bit more uh, conservative on the dye, you're going to see more shading. So um, you basically is just increasing the amount of visibility um, to the from the stroke to the pooling area basically whenever you lift your pen off the paper it creates a pooling zone for lack of a better term and if you're writing in print you get a lot of those mm -hmm. if you're writing a script then you pretty much just have one at the end of the word brian actually whenever i know that i have a heavily sheening ink which we'll get to later because i have been using one mm. i will actually lift my pen more often even if i'm writing in cursive really just to make just to get that uh uh, shading you betcha absolutely huh. interesting so i will still write in cursive but i'll pick it up after like every other letter sometimes every letter even um because it just looks so good interesting it looks so good i can't, um, can't say i've done that personally but uh i'll have to think about that now hmm. yeah so that's basically it very cool yeah i think um if you've if you've ever done any type of like art class of any kind or if you're familiar with doing drawing or coloring or whatever you know shading is basically where you just take and make one section of it darker to give a an effect of like a variance in lighting right so if you have 
you know, a picture and you just color it and all the color is just very flat and even, the picture doesn't look very dynamic. But if you do shading and you darken, you know, one side of, say, you're drawing a whatever house and you darken like one side of it, it makes it look like the lighter side, like the sun is coming from that direction. So you can just, with shading and art in general, you can, it's, it's that variance of like light and dark color. That's essentially what's happening here kind of automatically through what Drew was just talking about. Um, I've noticed too, it happens not only when you're picking up your pen like that, and obviously if you're like flex, if you have a pen with a soft nib or a flex nib or anything like that, that's going to cause, you know, more ink to come out uh, and giving you more shading as well. So if you have a heavily shading ink, uh, you're going to benefit tremendously from having a stub nib or a flex nib or even just a soft nib and you're writing with some pressure. But uh, the thing that I do actually like about cursive writing i don't do what drew does i don't pick up my pen more at least not consciously um, when i'm writing with a heavy shading ink but i do notice that more of the shading happens when i'm crossing over something like if i'm doing a loop on an e or something like that where the two parts of the loop cross over that ink can kind of like double up a little bit and you can get more sheen that happens at that crossover so there's lots of opportunities based on where you're pulling stopping changing direction crossing over all these things that's why you know depending on your writing style and how big you're writing and how wet your nib is how absorbent your paper is too that's a big deal with both sheening and shading inks that i think is worth mentioning because you can have ink that isn't like a necessarily heavy heavy shader or, or sheener that looks pretty flat and normal on just conventional paper especially if you have something really absorbent like an inkjet paper you know that's made to absorb ink and you know if you think about when you're using an inkjet printer you want that ink to dry almost immediately so that the next sheet of paper that comes through will be dry and it will not smear as you're printing things out of the printer that's how it's designed if you have you know, a laser printer paper, that is actually the opposite. It's a whole different type. It uses toner instead of ink. And that dries more on the surface. So you want actually a less absorbent paper. So if you are in like an office setting and you have a choice between inkjet and laser printer paper, always go laser if you're using a fountain pen. That no matter which brand, no matter which, you know, weight or whatever, laser paper is always going to you know, be a better option for you. Um, then if you can get like a premium laser, that's going to be slicker, thicker, all that good stuff. It's just going to be even better. So anyway, that's, that's a great, that's a great pro tip, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. That's I think, a nice little wis wi wisdom nugget there. I think, you know, what would be an interesting experiment for everybody would be to take, <clears throat> take the ink that you already have. Like there are the ones that are like the really standout, heavily advertised ones that are the shaders, sheeners, whatever. But I think you might actually be surprised how many of your pens could get some, um, you know, nice sheening or shading effects with the right paper, the right ink. So, sorry, I said pens. Which of the pens and ink that you already have, just by changing up some of the paper, you might be able to, to pull out some of those characteristics of that ink just by kind of mixing it up a little bit. So going with a less absorbent paper and um, a heavier, wetter nib, uh, you could actually start to pull some of those out. You know, Yamabuto drew, like you said, being a good example. That is not... That is not a color that you would typically associate. It's not advertised as having any of these types of properties, um, but you can definitely get some of that uh, some of that sheening on certain types of paper with a certain type of nib. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's there, it's there for you if you find it. What yeah. about uh, sheening? Sheening, yeah. So. Um, that is when you are born with the last name Estevez, but your dad has a funky last name and you decide to take it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're it's called cheating, yeah, if you're winning, then you can definitely, um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, sheening is a little more complicated and, uh, with shading, you can get shading with pretty much any ink. And even if you have an ink that's really, really saturated and it doesn't shade a lot, you can actually dilute the ink and you can make it shade. So you can dilute it with distilled water in varying degrees. The more you dilute it, the more it's gonna shade basically. So you can pretty much water it down and it's gonna and it's gonna give you, you know, not like the more you like there is a there is a point where it's not helpful anymore to dilute it, but you know, to a varying degrees, you can get you can get uh, a shading effect in pretty much any ink if you're trying. Sheen is different though. You can't just like add a sheening component and get sheening on any ink. So sheening is a little more of a, it's more of a byproduct that happens on certain 
ink colors, certain dyes in particular. So basically sheening, to explain what it is just kind of visually, especially for our audio listeners here, sheening is when you have an ink, typically, you know, maybe say it's a dark blue, Organic Studio Nitro is a very just obvious example. It's a dark blue, but then when you look at it at a certain angle and a certain light, it gets this like really ir- iridescent like red, kind of highlight to it so and as you especially as you're just like moving the paper back and forth you're changing your light source i mean you can literally see it's like shining and reflecting this red color out of the blue it looks sometimes it looks like it's all red absolutely um so that is actually happening because of light refraction um so it has to do with the particular constant the concentration of the particular dyes uh that are in that ink happening on the paper so the heavier the ink load the more ink resistant the paper the more that's going to pull on there similar kind of effect as you would have with shading um except it's getting this light refraction property to it um which is the similar um kind of uh, effects like if you've ever looked at like an asphalt like a paved road or your paved driveway or something like that and you spray water on it or it's like a fresh rain and you see there's puddles and there's like that kind of uh rainbow kind of like iridescent yeah like thing going on in the puddle that's because there's oil from the you know the roads and cars and all that kind of stuff that settles on the pavement and then when you get a fresh rain the oil is lighter than the water and so what's happening is the light is actually refracting through the oil and giving that kind of prismatic sort of rainbow effect that is a very similar kind of effect of what's happening with these sheening inks on the page so again if you have a really absorbent paper and it's just soaking up all the ink you're not going to see that as much because you know the light isn't able to really get down in there and and refract it's just all getting absorbed into the paper but if you have an ink resistant paper you're going to get that smoother surface and you're going to see more of that refraction um so Unfortunately, I don't know exactly which dyes and exactly what properties those dyes have that, you know, kind of cause this refraction um, because this falls into the situation where it's proprietary and it's not really advertised often about having sheen, that kind of thing. Um, But it tends to fall within certain color groups. We have some, I guess, observational, you know, kind of data on some of these things and certainly gets talked about and shown on Instagram and people try to show off whenever there's like a sparkle or sheen or whatever, because it looks really cool. Um, So I think that, you know, it tends to happen with dark blues, happens a lot with greens as well. That's where you get those red sheens, you know, thinking Organic Studio, again, is a great example. They have the Walden, that's kind of that green with the red sheen, you get the nitrogen. Um, those are some examples. Um, you might get those with some purples and reds as well. A little bit of the Yamabudo is kind of in that magenta family, but purples like the um, Lamy Amazonite, if you, the crystal, Lamy Crystal Amazonite, um, it's got a, it's a deep purple, but it has almost like a, like a green green sheen to it almost as this like you know interesting like radioactive ninja turtle kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yama, yamabudo doesn't really have a red sheen either it's kind of like a mustard uh yeah, sheen. It's like a, so it's it's, yeah. it's funny like the, the the purples that sheen don't sheen they don't sheen red, red like usually. the blues do it's like they, a they, yellowish they, greenish kind of color yeah right? it's a more earth tone yeah mm-hmm. yeah and even um jacques Urban, the 1670 rouge hematite that was uh one of that was not only one of the original Um, shimmer inks that before that was really a known terminology Uh, but it was also a really good shader and had like a pretty heavy gold uh, kind of yellowy gold kind of sheen to it as well heavy on the green as well so you know again there's probably some dye component that it just whatever I think there's something from a chemical standpoint a physical chemical standpoint that is beyond my knowledge of science um, that is causing the refraction you know with certain dyes to then look a certain hue or a certain color in that refraction kind of property but uh that is what we've noticed but uh, you know it's not like you know you don't get that a lot with oranges you don't get a lot with yellows you know there's there's a lot of colors that really don't have this sheening effect it tends to be kind of in that blue purple pink red kind of range and not really too much um beyond and green i don't know should i said that but usually it's really really dark colors it happens more but yeah there you go that's Very that cool. is sheening and i will just add on top of that if you would like to get an example of sheening and shading inks if you go to our website and click the ink header we will have a whole category drop down with lots of different categories including sheening inks and shading inks which aren't 
every single ink that can shade and every ink, single ink that can sheen, yeah. but our picks of the most common, most easily recognizable ones or yeah. the ones that are really well known mm -hmm. for one of those two properties. So check them out. Pick them up, uh, grab some samples if you want to play around and see what you can get. That's right. And if you haven't seen my top shading inks video, it's pretty entertaining because I'm wearing a women's trench coat that covers my shorts and it makes me look like a flasher that was not it was, it not, it was not intentional but it definitely happened. it was what we had it we're, was what we had we're going for a film noir kind of look and it was we filmed it in the middle of summer and our choices for inexpensive trench coats were very few and far between and that's what they had at goodwill so uh anyway it's pretty entertaining if you haven't seen that already all right what you got next for us drew i'm gonna put you in the hot seat for this next question brian you ready Ooh, for this oh i think i'm ready all right. This one says specifically for Brian. So I'm just going to sit back and listen to you on this one. Okay. Here's one specifically for Brian. Have you had to or found that your that you temper your initial recorded reactions to products more the longer you are in the biz? Basically, do you temper your reactions more as you're now than in the I used longer? to kind of thing? Okay. Yeah. It seems like you are a little less circumspect slash cautious in your early reviews first five to six years i kind of miss some of that freedom you seem to have when you were flying under the radar slash had less presence in the fountain pen world elizabeth wrote this via email hmm. that's a good one brian are you different and if so why do you hold back more why do you do that if you do do that if i do do that mm. um well you know i thought about this First of all, I've been doing these videos for 11, 12 years. So just that's that's approaching half my life at, uh, in, in not too many years from now. So um, yeah, for sure, there's going to be things that I approach differently just because it's been so much time. Um, I think that uh, in general, I try to be pretty thoughtful now. Um, I was trying to be thoughtful back then too. I just didn't have as many thoughts to have because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> uh, still largely don't. But uh, no, I think in general, my, my approach towards reviews is the same, or at least I try to be the same. I'm not making a conscious thought to like psych myself out and be like, oh my gosh, there's gonna be so many people that see this or, you know, there's gonna be uh, our team members or my family or our suppliers or whoever that's gonna watch this is gonna say such and such about it if I say a certain thing. You know, honestly, if I thought about it that much, I wouldn't ever record anything because it would just be overwhelming. So I think there's a certain degree of just authenticity. There's a certain degree of, you know, candor that I, I just need to be comfortable having to even be able to do this at all. Um, now that said, I think that definitely my opinions have been shaped over the years uh, through feedback that I've gotten from previous videos, uh, just my experiences in general. You know, just think of how many pens I've handled now versus how many I did in the first couple of years. Um, it's just a lot more experience to draw upon. It's a lot more, I don't know, to think about uh, uh, across experiences that I've had. Um, you know, it's like a pen that I used in my first year or two you know, in year three, that was a pretty recent memory. But if I haven't used that pen from year one and two, that was now a decade ago. So I have to think like, oh gosh, what was that pen like? You know, so I'm just, there's certain things that are just, I'm having to draw further back in my memory or, <coughs> excuse me, I just have more in my mind that's going on when I pick up a pen or I pick up a, you know, ink or paper or whatever. There's so many more brands, there's so many more things to think about. Um, I've seen factories, I've, you know, gotten, so much detailed technical information about how all these various things are made. Um, I think in the, in the early days, I had more of a superficial assessment, maybe, I guess, because I just didn't have as much in-depth knowledge. I didn't have as many, you know, experiences with all different kinds of brands. Um, and so now I just, I have more of that experience. So I, I probably am just a little more thoughtful and I try to prepare just a little bit, uh, mainly because I want to just be thorough and I want to make sure that I'm, you know, bringing, you know, accurate information and, and, and a thoughtful opinion to things. Um, I can still definitely just give like a raw opinion and that's fine. I'm comfortable doing that. But I think honestly, if I don't sit down and think about it for a little bit longer, I tend to say some of the same types of things over and over again in some of my more superficial assessments. Um, just because um, by the time you record 2000 videos, it's like, how do you not repeat yourself over and over? You know, you know what I mean, Drew, because you've done a bunch too. It's like, okay, how many pens have medium to wet flow and have 
average dry time and you know like everything kind of falls yeah. how into many times just, can i describe what a yovo nib writes like yeah exactly it's like okay i mean it got to the point where like i stopped doing you know actual reviews and assessments of the new lamy safari for that year because i was like i've done like 10 of these already like what more am i gonna say you know so i think that probably just in those earlier days i just everything what i was saying was fresher and was new and now it's like, I've already said it. So it's like, I got to come up with new stuff to say or just take approach it in a different way. So now you know, just using like a Lamy Safari that comes out as an example, I'm going to pull out like all the past safaris. I'm going to talk about them and just maybe what inks will match and stuff like that. I'm not going to go as in depth as to what I think about that particular pen because I've already said it so many times in other videos. So I think, you know, it's definitely easy to kind of pick and choose and, you know, assess certain things. But um, largely it's just I, I try to approach it with a similar type of, you know, candor and vigor and excitement. Uh, but, you know, some of it is just age, maturity, experience, you know. I just have different things to bring to the table and I have different thoughts in my mind and I've gotten far less sleep as my kids have gotten older. And, you know, I probably just don't remember things quite as much, uh, you know, so, um, but you know, I really appreciate the question and I'm certainly going to um, take this to heart and I would love to get feedback. You know, I love the thing I love the most about just this format and YouTube and just Instagram and all these other, you know, mediums that we're on is, you know, people do tell us exactly what they think about what we're saying. And we get to see, okay, what do they find engaging? Um, do they want just an initial, let me just open up a pen and get an assessment. You know, in fact, in the last year or so, Drew, we've done that very intentionally. It's like, okay, let's not do a full produced in-depth review of a thing. Let's just literally just open it up, kind of unbox it style and just kind of goof around and just talk about what we think about this pen. I mean, you've done a great job of that because, you know, you have that perspective and you're quick on your feet, uh, word-wise. You know, with me, I've. How about we say? How about then. we say that Brian and I both hate the Beatles? See how that goes over on the YouTube comments. <laughs> oh goodness! There you go. Also, though, I will say that Brian never really roasted any pens back in the day. Like even when he was, you know, just kind of unboxing stuff, first impressions wise. You know, you you weren't ever like you know speaking ill and kind of like running gun and like, oh, this pen sucks. I hate the way it feels. It makes my blood curdle. You know. Um, no, I but, mean, uh, that's never been my style much. And oh. No, it's just, a, it's just a, an addition of context. Now, I will say, I think it would be a great idea, Brian, for you to one day do a reaction video to one of your early, early videos. What do you think about that? We actually may have that in the works already, Drew. So uh, a little, little hint there. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, I think all in all, I think, you know, we've, we try to do whatever we can do and I'd rather just get videos out and not really dwell too much on the way things used to be. And I think we got to do what makes sense now. Um, but I think, um, you brought up a point and I sort of forgot it, um, regarding the, the Beatles. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> Rachel's not a big fan of the Beatles, by the way, I give her a hard time about it. I think they're, Oh, I, I don't, I don't like the Beatles at all. I think they're fine. I mean, I don't like they're, listen I guess to them fine. all the time. They've a lot. I mean, they're obviously very influential. Yeah, they're obviously things. good. I just don't have a. I'm not. It's not your not your cup of tea. Um, no, but I think that one of the biggest things I've learned is that um, even if I hate a pen, there's going to be people out there that that's their favorite pen and they freaking love it. Like this is such yeah. a dynamic hobby interest that I mean, basically everybody loves and hates every single thing that we talk about like there's always a mixture of feedback there's no one universal thing that everybody loves everybody hates everybody whatever so part of what i enjoy is just like more just kind of presenting the information i definitely have my own preferences and i always try to to disclaim what are my preferences versus what are the facts about this object um and i probably try a little more to present the more objective you know parts of pens um Honestly, because even with new stuff that comes out, I still approach it with some natural curiosity. And I, I don't usually make a snap judgment about pens. I'm usually digging into them quite a bit and just asking a lot of questions, trying to experience them before I have like firm opinions about them. So I don't know. I'd be curious. I'd be curious to know what uh, some of these early videos Elizabeth might be referencing that are the ones that were really enjoyable. I think there were definitely ones that we like had goofy intros and stuff where it was spent a little more time on like the production side, having fun with them and stuff like that, that I do kind of miss uh, doing, but it just takes a lot of time and it's been harder to fit that in with my busy schedule. So yeah, be curious, curious to know in the comments, what y'all think about this whole topic. All right, moving along. This next question is from Ashiraz Nook. What's your favorite rainy day activity? 
and we've got some rainy days this week drew so i have yeah it's actually coming at a pretty good time yeah it's been uh it rained like crazy yesterday and i think we've got more on the schedule for this week and next you seem you seem like a rainy day activity kind of guy well, my rainy day activities are my everyday activities. All of my <laughs> hobbies involve being inside. So me True. doing my rainy day activities is just me doing my regular activities and not feeling bad that I should be doing something outside or something more productive. So <laughs> um, I do love rainy days, though. I, I will say, though, it doesn't keep me inside. Like, I love playing video games. I love working on little, you know, tinkery hobbies, you know, I, I, the stuff like that. Just spending time with the kid, building forts with him and stuff like that. But I also love the rain. I love driving in the rain. I love walking in the rain, not getting wet, but I get excited when I get to use my umbrella. My wife makes fun of me all the time because I, I'm always ready with an umbrella. I keep an umbrella in my bag here. I'm I, I, There's one in the car right now, so I have one in the office with me in case I need to go to the car. But if ever I'm in the car without one, there's one that stays in there. And it's like this... Whenever I get to use an umbrella, it's like I'm I'm beating nature. I feel like I'm like achieving a victory like ha ah, not today clouds and it's kind of like being in a when i'm when i'm in a kayak i feel the same way if i'm on the water i'm like ha i'm not supposed to be floating on this but i am screw you nature i got you i got your number it's so dumb i know it's stupid but like if i've got a really good rain jacket i'm just walking i'm like yeah ha nice try i, just, I don't know i get a lot of enjoyment out of that <laughs> and I think driving in the rain is fun too. Obviously, I'm careful. I don't go nuts, but it's like a new exciting challenge. Driving in the snow, driving in rain, it's not as boring. It's There's a new element to it. New things need to be considered, and hmm. I think it's fun. So I don't let the rain keep me in. If I've got to go do stuff, I still go do stuff, and I'm not going to stand outside and you know cut the grass or anything. But if I need to go run errands, then yeah, that, that's even more fun. That's super you know, try to get that umbrella in the car while shutting the door really quick. It's like a fun little game. Mm. That's normal, right? What's your favorite umbrella style? Are you like a big golf umbrella guy or are you more of a one of those ones that's like bubbles up around you like really, really tall? You know, have you ever seen those kind of things? I don't have one of those yet. No, oh, I yeah. like gigantic umbrellas. I don't own a golf umbrella, but I did buy one from Home Depot that's just plain black. That That's pretty huge. Oh, yeah. That I one's think my f- I might have that same one. <laughs> yeah. That, that one's my favorite one. Um, but, you know, obviously I, ca- I carry the little rickshaw bag and I have a little tiny umbrella in there. But, nice. uh, yeah, whatever gets the job done. I'm not picky. The one that I like to have, it's a small one I keep in the car and it's small enough where I can keep it in like the water bottle pouch on my backpack. You know my backpack, Drew. It's like the car. I know your backpack. It's like the cargo pants of backpacks. Um, but I like it because it's got where it's fairly compact, but it's also pretty sturdy. It's not huge, but it's easy to carry around. But it's got it where you where when it's fully open, you can push the button and it collapses the top. Yeah. 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 It doesn't collapse That's it completely. What I have. Not all umbrellas do that. Like I remember when that was really not a thing. Um, but I think that uh that's super handy when you're getting into the car or like stepping inside or whatever. Yeah. You can just push one button, the thing collapses, and then you can like sneak The super sneak handy there. one for the car is the one that folds upwards and you can kind of pull it in. It doesn't fold downwards. If yeah, you, that's uh, like really a whole to. thing. That's, that's like up in thing. your game. That's up in the umbrella game there. Definitely. Definitely. Cool. What All are your rainy day activities, Brian Goulet? Um, I think I'm kind of like you, Drew. I don't really have like specific activities i save up to do in the rain i just largely do some of the activities that i already do i just happen to do them when they rain now i I do a lot more intentional stuff outdoors i'm doing a lot of landscaping and you know these types of things i ride my bike i do all that kind of stuff um i do not like road biking in the rain i've i'm not afraid to do it like I've, i've definitely had times where i've been out riding and then a storm comes and I'm like in the rain, I'm kind of like you, it's like kind of fun and different. And you know, like I've gone running and mountain biking is pretty fun in the rain because you don't have to worry about cars. Um, But you just reach a point where you're like so muddy, so dirty and wet and all that, that you're just like, you reach the point where like, well, I can't get any more wet or any more muddy. So let me just go right through this gigantic puddle and just make a huge mess. And that's pretty darn fun. Or like if I'm running in the rain and I'm just like completely drenched, then I'm like gonna run into the puddles and run in ditches and just make a giant mess. I don't know, it's like the little kid in me, you know, that that can come out. I won't like be sitting at home and it starts to rain. I'm like, ooh, let me throw my shoes on and go run out in the rain. But like, if I was already happened to do it, I don't know, I had one time where I was last time not the last time, but a couple times ago when I went up to Rachel's parents' house, um, I brought my mountain bike up there. 
because we were there for a few days or whatever. And uh, I was exploring the mountain bike and riding on some some trails and stuff. And I knew that there was a chance of rain and it was like a pretty big chance of rain. I was like, well, let me see if I can get out and back before I get back. I did not make it back. And it was like a torrential storm. Mm. I actually got some video of it. It was so torrential, but I mean, I got completely drenched, but it was so fun because, you know, it was just got the adrenaline, got pumping and all that kind of stuff, especially because it was a storm and like Rachel was not super happy with me that I did, didn't get back before the storm because I was like, oh yeah, the trees were swaying and, you know, branches could have fallen on me while I was riding and that kind of thing. But I had a helmet on, so I was, felt pretty safe. Um, anyway, so yeah, but I do other things. I do woodworking. I do pen, you know, stuff, obviously, pen cleaning, playing with the pens. You know, I do puzzles, Rubik's Cubes, that kind of stuff. So I do a lot of the same stuff. I just might, you know, if I know that it's going to be raining in the afternoon, and then it's in the morning on a Saturday or something, I might mow the lawn in the morning and then do some of my other indoor activities in the afternoon, you know? So I just kind of scheduled around that. I do random stuff around the house, like fixing stuff or cleaning up or whatever, whenever it's raining. But yeah, I'm not a big like curl up in a book and sip tea by the window when it rains, that kind mm. of thing. It's just not my, my lifestyle doesn't fit that very much. Cause that sounds amazing. It sounds awesome, but I just don't do any of those things anyway. So I don't know. Maybe when I'm older and like the kids are out of the house and I actually like have a quiet house to enjoy in the rain. Right now it'd be like my kids yelling and fighting and playing video games and screaming, you know, cause they have lots of energy and when it's raining all day and they can't get outside and play, they just run around the house and yell and fight. And I'm Rachel See, and I. See, Archer's very, Archer's very different. Whenever we tell Archer <laughs> we need to go somewhere, he'd much rather stay inside. Oh yeah, he's got his dad's yeah. jeans on that one. <laughs> yeah, oddly enough, he really loves archery. So that that hey. is a good way to get him outside. He like he likes shooting his bow and arrow. He does like to. That's go out pretty and do cool. That. I remember that being really yep. fun, kind of around that age. Yeah, very cool. Yep. Nice. All right. Uh, next question this week comes from what I thought was J- Jade Twyler or J T Weiler, but now I'm thinking it's J A Detweiler. Either way, uh, let me know. <laughs> but this one's all for you, Brian Goulet, because J.A. Detweiler, or Jade Twyler, asks, what are some good pens for sweaty hands? Um, yeah. Um, you know, I thought about this. I don't, I don't know. I sweat a lot. I don't know that I would say that I have sweaty hands. <gasps> I have oil. Really? I have oily hands. Okay, well, there you go. That's like lubricant. My hand, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how much we want to distinguish. Whatever. <laughs> I have a lubricated <laughs> hands. That, oh, that sounds really weird. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Anyway, I have large hands. I have, you know, whether it's sweat or hand oil or whatever, just uh, just part of my genetic makeup, it happens. Um, so I, I end up dealing with this quite a bit. And I, I thought about like, oh, specific pens, let me try and come up with some. And honestly, the list was so extensive of ones that I thought were adequate or good to mention that it was more of like maybe i just need to mention which ones aren't as ideal because that was yeah. a that was a smaller list um so yeah. honestly most pens are fine i think it's more about avoiding some of the worst traits that happen when you have like you know some type of hand lubrication issue um try and avoid slick metal grips i think a lot of times they feel kind of cool because they're like a little cool to the touch and kind of slick and all that kind of stuff but like if i'm using it for more than i don't know 30 seconds it ends up slipping around in my hand and I usually end up having to grip the pen too tight to keep it from slipping around that it cramps my hand up and it'll, I'll even get, get like indents on my fingers because I'm gripping the pen so tight to keep oh, it from wow. moving around if I'm using it for even just a few minutes. Um, okay, so, that, so the, the new uh, the new Idios, the Lamy Idios is not going to be a pen for you then. Well, that one, I don't know. I'll have to... S- is it because it's, it's angled though? That one actually taper, might stay put a little bit better. May, the taper mm-hmm. may come into play there. So that one has got the slick metal thing. Um, if it's a really thin grip, that's not as great either because it's not as much surface area to grab. If it's a fatter pen, that tends to be a little bit easier. Um, but the slick metal grip, that's the biggest thing I have a challenge with. And especially if it's heavily tapered, like pretty much the, the classic like worst pen for me to use, especially if it's like summertime and I'm kind of sweaty and stuff anyway, is the Lamy Studio conventional grip. It's slick, metal, round, and tapered, and it just like, I can't hang on to that thing. Um, now that said, the Lamy Studio stainless steel has that like rubberized grip. That is fantastic. If you can, yes. like that is like the best grip, that rubbery kind of thing going on there. So a lot of it has to do with like the texture of the grip, the material that's made of that kind of thing. Um, if it's got 
an indented grip, you know, like part of the reason we designed our Edison Premier the way that we have is it's got this kind of concave grip that your fingers just kind of settle in there nicely. So even though it's got a bit of a taper to it, it tapers towards the middle and um, you know, it doesn't like slip off the end of the pen. It's really easy and comfortable to hold. So yeah. Or like really a, re- what, what about like a really severe um, <coughs> stop at the end, like the Edison ascent, that thing comes to a yeah, very, yeah. or the men, the Menlo does that as well. A very decisive stop. Like you, your hands, not it, your fingers are going to stop at that point. They yeah, exactly. To. If you have, as long as you have something to kind of contain it, like the studio doesn't mm-hmm. really have that. It just kind of just like slips off into no. the abyss. Um, yes. So that one, you know, that's a bit of a challenge for me again, mainly when writing for more you know i like that as a snap cap so that's that's actually okay because i'll just use it for quicker notes and stuff so i won't carry around and use that pen you know all the time but i will you know rip whip it out every now and then again um i think if you want to go with something that is like truly ideal for people with you know hand moisture (laughs) concerns um any type of absorbency or grip that you can get a rubberized grip or um any type of material that naturally has a little bit of grip or absorbency to it um i looked up the term so i know homo sapiens they've used that lava material they use the term hygroscopic um hygroscopy technically i've been using this term for a long time but i tried to actually look it up because somebody commented a little while ago they were like technically hygroscopy is not actually what's happening there i don't remember yeah like that 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 takes it out of the <clears throat> air right yeah so technically that's when something is absorbing moisture out of the air right mm-hmm. which may actually be happening but i don't know that that's actually what's causing it to grip it might be like a more of a you know uh uh that's not the actual term to explain what's happening to cause the grip but pens that have that hygroscopic nature will be better for this type of thing so it, i think it's like close enough kind of thing again I, it may be it may actually be some capillary action that's happening that's causing the moisture from your fingers when you're physically touching it you may actually be dealing with capillary action with the nature of that material but anyway the point is not the semantics of what that's actually called the point is that there are certain materials for example that homo sapiens that basaltic lava material the zeolite that Panider has now that's got a similar vibe to it um ebonite you know that hard rubber that natural rubber um true celluloid that nitrocelluloid um that that stuff has it as well because that's got a cellulosic kind of fiber to it basically any natural material is going to have some of that in there any anything that's made of pulp or cotton fiber or anything that's that comes from that um will naturally have that uh, more grippy nature to it and certainly if you have like an actual rubber you know grip again that's also a natural natural material so um but even if you just have regular resin i think it's okay you know like an you know acrylic uh, acetate or something like that that you would get with like an edison or like you know, there's like quartz like materials or swirly materials. If you get an injection molded plastic, those are generally okay too. It's it's mainly just the slick metals that are troublesome. Now that said, if you have a matte finish on a pen, that can make all the difference in the world. Like for example, the Lamy 2000, if you want to compare that to a Lamy Studio, you've got a metal tapered grip, but I have no problem writing with that pen because it's got that heavy brushing to it on the finish. So um, I think some of it has to do with whatever the finish is. You know, for example, like the um, uh, Diplomat Arrow has got, you know, a heavy matte texture on the grip of that pen, even though it's metal, even though it's tapered and not the thickest grip in the world. I have no problem with that one because it's got a nice matte texture. My fingers do not slip around. So I think the bigger, the fatter the grip, the more texture you have on the grip, the less you have to really be concerned about whatever the material is. But you know i love like the homo sapiens grip because you get the concave nature you get that you know hygroscopic capillary whatever effects that makes it grippier you know the shape of it the diameter everything works really well that is is kind of the ultimate and that's why it's one of my favorites um yeah those are all considerations for us sweaty hand folk (laughs) nice thanks (laughs) all right now we got a hypothetical drew we do. What are you going to hypotheticalize? Uh, Hypo- hypo- all right. Hypothesize? Hypo- hy- what's the term there? Are we hypothesizing? Hypothesizing. Hypotheticalizing. Um, yes. Well, Mr. Goulet. Today, we're going to be talking about the fountain pen industry. So, Brian, if you could snap your fingers and fix one problem that you see exists within the fountain pen industry, what would it be? 
Sorry, say that again. I'm literally like being it's, slacked right now. There's like a hard drive that's failed at the office and they're like, do you have a spare? We need to order it. And I'm just like, okay. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, give me that's, one second. <laughs> I should be talk like, to the owner. I'm recording a video right now. Yeah, say that. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if I would consider that in problem within the fountain pen industry though we are in the fountain pen industry that hard drive might be the answer to this question but i was thinking something a little bit more big picture okay anyway, go ahead sorry you, i'm listening you, now <laughs> if you could fix one problem within the fountain pen industry what would it be Ooh. like 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 you know uh hmm. I, I don't know fake fake pens or something like that Oh, like or, counterfeit or could, pens or, could, or something like that? Counter, yeah, so some, something that exists like maybe hmm. a little bit more behind the scenes that would help make the industry healthier, better, more welcoming. Um, hmm. Just That's a great question. There's so many things that I would... <laughs> <laughs> How many things can you talk about? <laughs> I know, right? This goes back to our question of like, what would I have said in the early days versus what would I say right now? No, <laughs> well, no, no, honestly, no. right now you do have the burden of context. You know a whole lot more about the industry than you did. That's back true. Then. That's true. Um, yeah. No, honestly, like I'm kind of torn because there are so many things that are, uh, I don't want to say like problematic, but things that are challenges or, you know, complications within the industry that we have tried to compensate for that have ended up being some things that are actually differentiators for us and that, you know, add, add value to you know, specifically to Goulet customers and all that. So it's like, while yes, it's annoying to have to do all this extra work and overcome some of these things because not everybody's willing to do it. It does actually kind of help us stand out a little bit, you know, like okay. quality of stock photography that we're given or the technical specs that we get, or, you know, some of these things and you know, Drew, like just some of these things, it's like, you you all out there in audience land you would be amazed at how much we basically just have to figure out when there's new products that come out like you look at our site and you look at all those detailed specs and information and all this stuff very little of that is actually just kind of like handed to us in that way you know so we have to do quite a bit of detective work to actually in quite a bit of verifying just to make sure like oh we got an email blast over here that says it's made of this material but then on Instagram, this company posted that it's made of this different material. Which one is it? You know, and we have to yeah. follow up and verify. You know, that happens all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. Which interesting? Which challenge? Hmm. I think for me personally, it's gonna be a it's gonna be kind of a broad one, but I'm gonna say um, su supply issues. Mm. just like consistency so instant, instantly more celluloid being produced right yeah like consistent <laughs> consistency of supply i think for pe fountain pens for as small uh, and as i don't know seemingly simple as these objects may appear to be they're actually surprisingly complicated and use a quite a number of components that any one of those components that don't come together perfectly can hold up the whole you know, product line and things from being released and, you know, something that launches, but then it's out of stock for four months after its launch and these types of things. I mean, we end up dealing with that so much. Yeah. It makes it very, very difficult for you all as, uh, you know, pen users to predict and know what to get excited about and all this kind of stuff um, and be able to plan and budget and all this type of stuff. But, it, you know, it also makes it kind of exciting and feeds the FOMO a little bit maybe. But, you know, for us as retailers, it makes it so difficult to predict how many of something we should buy. You know, if we want to try to promote something or carry something and develop something for the holiday season or whatever, but then it misses and now it's coming out in January and okay, we, we got it, but then we got shorted on half the shipment and okay, we were going to send out an email and do a video but now we're not because we would be over promoting it and we wouldn't have a stock of it and like i mean literally every single day we have morning meetings where we're having to adjust what's happening that day in large part because of stock issues and that has been yeah. ever since we got into this business i mean it's yeah. not just and that's not something it's not uh, just a to your thing. earlier yeah and to your earlier point that's not something an individual retailer can compensate for yeah and i don't know that yeah i don't know that it's like it's not just, it's not any one brand. It's like some brands kind of handle it. Manufacturers like handle it better than others. 
you know, and certainly if you have a company like, you know, Pilot, a larger company, they control a lot of their own components and they make a lot of stuff in house as opposed to maybe a smaller, you know, manufacturer where they're sourcing clips over here and nibs over there and boxes over there and all this kind of stuff. You know, that's a lot more to coordinate, um, you know, and they just don't have as much of a buffer, I guess. Um, so some companies you'll feel that kind of caterpillar effect more than others. Uh, but it's pretty universal. I think it's pretty common just in the whole industry. It has been ever since we got into it. I don't know that it's really going to change, frankly, because it's just a small industry and there's just not, yeah. there's just not like bountiful suppliers for any of this stuff, yeah. you know, and kind of like how we ran it. We discussed, you know, uh, you know, like last month about Tomoe River and how the company yeah. that makes this very, very precious, very, very popular fountain pen uh, centric item it's a it's a fraction of a fraction of what they actually do as their core business functionality and um there are a lot of businesses like that so that's a great that's actually a great, really good answer brian thank you yeah supply supply yeah there we go that would benefit everybody i agree what about you super what about you drew do you have anything to add to that or um no no i did not uh, i was gonna rely on your uh ah. um your experience as a uh, company leader on that one fair enough um, fair enough but uh, no, I certainly would agree with that. Uh, cool. I would probably, you know, uh, to piggyback a little bit on there, this is a little bit supply, it's tangential, I guess, mm. but more of a diversification of supply. Like, hmm. I, I'd love it if more than, you know, like let's, we've got a couple German companies that make universal steel nibs. I'd mm -hmm. love it if we had more of that, like more companies making universal feeds, more companies making nibs. So I guess it is related to supply, but like, I'd love it if there was, you know, if someone could say, yes, I want a Yovo nib and this other feed, but I also want to buy this spare Japanese made feed or this spare Italian made feed, like or nib, like just more, more options for, um, you know, parts and such. I think that would be, that'd be cool. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right. What do we got next? Oh. We carried a red pen this week. That we did. Now, Drew, you have not got to spend so much quality time with the custom 823 as you have in this past week. No, I, I am not the owner of an 823 like one of us yes, to be. Yes, I am an owner of it, and I love it, and I've talked about it before, so I could gush about it all day long, but I will be saying a lot of the same things I've said before. I'm curious to know what you thought of carrying it around. Well, one thing that I noticed and wanted to bring up based on the comments of our last PenCast video was that there were a good number of viewers and pen friends out there that also own a Pilot Custom 823 mm -hmm. and said, hey, all right, I'm going to break it out. I'm going to write with it alongside. And nice. that's super exciting. So if you're one of the few that has this pen and has been writing with it alongside us, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, and um, long story short, I absolutely adored my writing experience with this pen. I used Noodler's Golden Brown with the broad nib that this pen has. And wow, did it shade, Brian. Oh my gosh. It yeah. was a beautiful, beautiful thing. This light brown caramel shading ink with the amber pen. Like, oh my God. And when, when I did my recipe, I wrote a uh, recipe for some cookies this was Sunday evening, right as the sun was going down, and I'm just sitting there. Everybody else is in the pool. I'm like, whatever, pools are dumb. Um, <laughs> and I'm sitting there writing my cookie recipe, like, you know, really having a wild time. And just the, the lighting, the, the rich brownness of the ink with the rich, beautiful brownness of the pen, and then the light coming through the pen. Oh, my God. It was just a beautiful beautiful writing experience moment for me probably the best writing experience we've had since doing the pen of the week um i was just really really amazed by it i uh, used my new endless uh recorder notebook because this is going to be my recipe book i um started uh, I, I i made a title that says that's it i've discovered a new recipe because in the video game i'm playing there's a character that says that a lot and he's like has an english accent and he says recipe and so that's what I did. I filled out some table of content stuff. I drew a little picture of a cookie for my cookie section. I have one recipe in there, but it's a cookie recipe. 
But there we go, I got my ingredients, I've got steps one through five written down there. It was a blast and a half. Um, broad nib, Brian, great for shading, because you're putting down more ink, not mm -hmm. so great for drying. So I will say that the broad nib, um, when you're putting stuff in a notebook and you're turning pages, mm -hmm. um, you are gonna, you know, get some get some pretty severe pooling there. Well, so. something worth noting there with the broad nib, you know, I think there's, I don't know, maybe somewhat of a misnomer that, with Japanese made nibs, sometimes it gets kind of glossed over and, and people say that all Japanese nibs write finer than their Western counterparts. That is not the case. I think across m most Japanese brands that at least I can name, the finer nibs, specifically mm -hmm. extra fine, fine, and they often have a medium fine, you know, those will be finer than their Western counterparts. Once you get to the mediums and broads, they're pretty similar. You know, I think the, the, the Japanese nibs tend to have a medium fine in there between the fine and the medium that skews the finer nibs a little towards the finer side. So you basically have an extra nib size in there on most of the Japanese brands that are, that are it's squeezing in and kind of shifting all the finer nibs, fine, fine nibs finer but the medium and the broad is kind of the same. So what you're saying about the broad, about it writing wet and all that kind of stuff, it's the same thing you would see in any broad nib pen oh, yeah. pretty much it across felt, the board. It felt like, you know, a German broad. Like it was mm -hmm. it was it was a standard broad, but it the richness, the color, I, I have no complaints. I'll deal with the slower dry time for the loveliness of the ink that it put down. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. so uh, the weight and the form factor I thought was perfect. I did post it. Um I really enjoy it. And I was writing in my lap, so I did not want to keep track of the um, cap anywhere. So I did post it, but I really liked the weight of it posted. I thought it was really well balanced. A little back weighted, but I don't mind that. And then um, as far as the vacuum filler goes, it filled perfectly as, as expected. Nice. I did have to um, open up the knob one time to let some more ink in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just kind of like, I. I I wasn't since I can't see the ink in the feed because the grip is opaque. Right. I kind of I left it open for a little while while I wrote a little bit just mm -hmm. to make sure that some ink went in there. Sure. Um, and I was like, yeah, maybe I should just finish writing with it open, but I could not do it. I, I no? was hold. I was holding the well because you once you do that you can't really. I didn't want to post it because you can post with it. no, the, you can post it. But the knobs open. That that this that felt weird. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't like it, I, and then, I, so I was like... I know where you're coming from. I felt the same way at first, but there's enough room inside there when you're posting it. It's not grabbing onto that knob, so you yeah. can actually post it, and that knob can be kind of free-floating in there. So if you do post your pen, you can open up that back knob and post your pen, and yeah. it's literally no different. So I didn't try it. It just felt counterintuitive, like I shouldn't. But fair enough. Fair enough. Anyway, and it's also not my pen, so I'm like, all right, I'm not going to mess around with okay, that. Okay, that's a, cool. that's a okay. big part, too. You know me, Drew. You know... There, I can't tell. Yeah. I can't tell you all the number of times that Drew has like brought something to me hesitantly. He's like, "I know you're supposed to be able to take this feed out or this nib or whatever," and I'm like, "Well, if I break it, it's mine." So, you know, and I just yank it. And yep. Sometimes I break it, and sometimes I'm like, "Oh, okay, no, that just you really got to tug it just a little bit past the point where you think you're going to break it." But then right. it turns out that's what it just needed. So I'm usually the one to have to like push the limits <laughs> you know yep. i've definitely that like, has happened that has happened a lot yeah i've broken stuff beyond the point of you know repair uh sometimes but that's that's a fraction small fraction of the time but anyway yeah yeah so. um and one thing i will close out with uh we talked about this in an earlier pen cast about how i value balance when it comes to opaque and translucent portions of the pen yes you're okay weirdly this, specific about that this has it's not weird brian it's totally normal listen all right this pen is well balanced mm -hmm. you've got an opaque finial an opaque knob everything in between is translucent and then even when you're writing with it unposted opaque translucent opaque this is how you do it you don't have yeah. a whole clear pen with just an opaque grip section yeah. or a whole opaque pen with just a clear grip section that that's that's madness that's that's the wild west brian lawless uh you feel different about that than i do but i can appreciate 
I can appreciate the, the there's there's the there's personal beauty preference. and symmetry. Yes. Well, I think that too. That's that's kind of classic to just their design in general. I think even if you look at just the trim components, you know, it's mm -hmm. like it's got a really nice balance of you know the gold trim and stuff like that. It's not like it's really heavily weighted on one side or the other. So I don't know. It's just, visually, it's a very very just attractive pen. My my one thing is I wish that they would expand the color options on this like they do the Custom 74. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for them to do that, but I can't really, I mean, that's not a genuine complaint about this pen because it's a great pen as it is. And they have expanded to the smoke. It used to literally just be amber. So, yeah. you know, it might take them another decade to have some colors, but, you know, I would welcome that and invite that. I think it would be um, generally very well accepted you know this pen this pen was kind of a sleeper for a while when we first started carrying pilot honestly for the first five years or so um you know the a23 wasn't really talked about a whole ton um well neither was a custom 70 war for that matter it's kind of picked up steam over the years but um both both nibs are just fantastic this nib is slightly bigger slightly larger in size than the the custom 74 um so it's got a similar kind of like springy feel to it uh, perhaps maybe even a little bit more uh, the one that i used was a medium nib which i think is just a wonderful size all around i think it's a great balance between having really good shading nice wet flow things like that but you can still use it on like a bullet journal with a five millimeter ruling and it's not out of control like the broad starts to get a little unruly on a five millimeter ruling if you got a seven or an eight millimeter ruling, you're fine. I think it's going to write great. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, if you got a medium, I think that's a really good balance. The fine nib is really good too. But again, that's going to be a little on the finer side. So if you tend to go finer nibs, the fine one's going to be great for you. Medium is just like the the best all around, I think. And then the broad is great, especially if you've got you know an, an ink that's really going to show well. The ink capacity on this thing is huge. So that's one advantage to having this over you know a typical cartridge converter pen. This thing's going to hold like three to five times the capacity of what you would have on a cartridge converter pen. So it's going to be a great for, you know, just those heavy sheeners, heavy, you know, those, those ones that you really want to show off the ink. So there you go. I use Konpeki in mine. It was a perfect matchup. Just any Rochazu ink is going to just write awesome in a pilot pen. So um, again, I just, I won't gush too much more because Drew covered it pretty well, but great, great all around pen. Great for sweaty handed folk as well as I can, <laughs> attest to that one so um all right great drew so next pen that you want to choose i see you suggested the preppy here in our notes yeah i, I feel like you really want to swing could, that we, pendulum huh <laughs> that that was that was the idea yeah we yeah, would go yeah. way way down to the super accessible area okay. um if you have another idea well you know I'm, I'm all ears we could stick with pilot and go down to the uh kakuno or the blue mix or something like that no i, but, feel, I uh, feel like we could go the preppy i think we can go the preppy route i got those preppy was that i got a couple of weeks ago i haven't inked any of them up yet so that'd be kind of fun to, fun to match a color to one of those and you know carry that around a little bit that'd be kind of cool so i'm, I'm into the preppy if you are yeah, let's go. Okay, let's do it. cool. So we'll coordinate that behind the scenes, and then uh, we'll pick out our preppies next week. If y'all have any preppies too, bust it out, and we'll uh, we'll do it. Maybe one of us should eyedropper. Maybe I'll eyedropper a preppy. No, you should eyedropper because you hate eyedroppers. Yeah. No, I'm just yeah, kidding. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I wanted. I well, I tried to eyedropper the Explorer, but I was misled. Yeah, you were misinformed on that one. But mm. maybe I'll eyedropper it because I, I, that's more my thing anyway. I'll do go that. I'm it. curious what the wa the wah looks like with its translucent with the patterns and all that that'd be kind of hey fun. why not why why not why not i drop her that pen <laughs> i don't know what accent that is but whatever okay yeah we don't know cool all right fantastic what's happening drew next segment what's happening in your life <sighs> in my life i'm still working on archer's halloween costume i've got that thing uh sealed now i used plasti dip to kind of coat that because the foam's like super absorbent i can't just use paint i need to have mm. like some funky sticky stuff to adhere so still working on that hopefully i'll have it done uh would you say you know, that, by you say that, that, he... that foam is hygroscopic drew perhaps i don't know what it is does it it's, feel like it's... it's absorbing moisture from the air around it it, it very well may be <laughs> it very well may be you know what else um, is gonna do? It's gonna absorb that kid's sweat when he's walking around in that costume. He's gonna like you better bring a camelback or something so that he doesn't pass out while he's walking around the neighborhood. It's not a full suit. It's just like a a chest thing. Yeah, it's like a like an armor plating type of thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah okay. just just like a, a sleeveless thing. It'll be all right. You could have just saved um, some time and just plasti dipped his chest, you know, and just yeah, gone that, with that, that. Well, if this if this fails, that that is certainly what I'll do. 
Um, on Sunday, um, while I was doing awesome, wild and crazy journaling, while everybody else had uh, lame, boring, fun time swimming, we also had a uh, impromptu kind of chili cook off where you know our friends um, just made three different types of chili. There was like a white chili, a spicy chili, and a kind of the more tomatoy chili. And everybody was like arguing about it, and I was like the impartial one so i was like trying them all and everybody's like what do you think drew what do you think and i'm like mm-hmm, well, <laughs> let me decide yeah. um but uh in my in my excitement and zeal i ate far too much chili and ended up just laying on the floor mm. um that is a f- and that is a food you can eat too much of and- oh man but i wanted to I, I, I was like let me try all three and then i'll go back and get seconds for the one that i liked and i did that so i had four bowls of chili um <laughs> The trial, the trial bowls ended up being bigger than I thought. I'm like, let me just get a taste. But I'm like, that's not enough. Let me get a little bit more. So yeah, after full bowls, four bowls of chili, I'm laying there on the ground. And then our friend Josh walks in who works at a local bakery and they make homemade oatmeal cream pies that are just delicious. Ooh. And he knows they're my favorite. So he walks in late um, and then he literally dumps a pile of them onto the table. He's like, hey, Drew, I'll catch a bunch of oatmeal pies. I was like, oh, <laughs> Wow, that's a that's a dense treat as well. That's there's a lot. It is, but they're so good. They're fresh, oh, locally man. made. Oat, oh my god, that oatmeal is just gonna like soak up all the chili like fat and just like sit like a <laughs> rock in your stomach. <laughs> oh man. So it was a rough night, but it was it was it was also delightful. So anyway, wow, did that. Uh, and then uh, Sopranos, the TV show, came out with a movie prequel, and that um, uh, that launched. So we watched that on uh, Saturday night. Uh, it was really interesting because the you know, the character Tony Soprano was played by James Gandolfini, who uh, died mm-hmm. years ago. But his son, actually, his real life son, actually played young Tony Soprano in the film. So oh, that was that's kind of a big cool. deal. Yeah. So that was really good. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And then we also finally, we finished the first season of uh, Kim's Convenience on Netflix. Hey, that was hilarious. Hey, Rachel and I are watching really that. Really like that show. We, yeah, are you? Yeah, we're on season three, I think. We're like halfway through oh, wow. season yeah, three. Oh, wow, yeah, we just good. finished season one. It's really, lie, it's really, really good. It's really good. I really liked that one, so that was cool. So yeah, good, good, yeah. good week. It gets even better. Like, it picks up steam. It picks up steam in season two. You'll like it. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, it gets pretty funny. What about you? Um, let's see here. Oh, God, what have I been up to? Working like crazy. Joseph finished his quarantine, which he didn't have any symptoms or anything. So he didn't actually get sick. So that's good. Awesome. Um, good to hear. You know, yeah. So that's, that's good now. He can like have somewhat of a life again. Um, and that's good. So, um, yeah, I just, um, let's see here. I took a tree down. Um, I got a buddy of mine who, um, you know, like climbs trees. And uh, so we work together in tandem, just like, like I, I don't know, I would call us novice slash amateur arborists. So I've, I've taken down a number of trees and um, stuff like that, but uh, we have a lot of trees on our property. And so that's just a thing, like several times a year, I'll have trees that'll fall across our driveway and I gotta buck them up and the whole thing. Um, but yeah, we had this really big tree, probably this 90, 90 foot tall pine tree about 18 inches in diameter. That's like really close to our, pro- you know, like our structures on our property. And it just makes me nervous because a lot of the pine trees on our property have been dying. There's this beetle called the pine bark beetle that is um, killing a lot of pines in our local area. So um, how, how, so, so did you, did the whole thing fall or did you like take it down piece by piece? So if I'm like in the woods and not really around too much, I'm fine just felling it just in it's you know just falls and knocks into other trees and stuff and that's not a problem but when it's like within reach of a structure i just don't even really want to risk it so this one my buddy actually climbed up and like delimbed and we've got like a really we got a rope system and everything you know that, oh my that God. we string them down so i was on the ground with the ropes and i'm helping him pull him down he climbed up there with the full harness and gear and everything and was like delimbing it and then started oh wow basically take it down in chunks um, there's a lot of great YouTube videos out there about uh, doing tree wow. tree work, actually. So, did you buy him? Uh, did you buy him pizza or beer or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got we help we help each other out. We have all right. You know, as you can imagine, Drew, I don't have much of a climber's body, so I'm I'm not really one to go up into the trees. So. He's a lot spindlier than I am, and loves climbing. So he he. Lo- so if so if he if he needs like you know some sort of a you know, wolf 
fought, then he's going to call you and you're going to go start yeah. punching wild animals, right? Oh, I could do that. Yeah. You've got more of a wolf fighting physique, I feel. <laughs> I didn't know that was a specific physique, but... Um, you look like a charred kind of guy. Yeah. I'm a. I, I'm what you would call a groundsman. <laughs> I'm not a climber. I, you know, <laughs> groundsman. When I, can, when I can keep my feet on the ground, this is true in, in just about every aspect. Like when I was a kid, I tried climbing trees a couple, a couple of times. Nope. Like I think the most... Even when I was in like the military program at Virginia Tech, I think the most number of pull-ups I could do in a row was seven. And that was with like a lot of training. I just, I'm such a heavy guy and my limbs are long and my upper body is very awkward. I'm just a very top heavy person. So I'm very stable on the ground, but as soon as I go up into the air, I become very unstable. See, I'm unstable everywhere. Like literally, my five, my five foot two wife will hug me, and I'm like about to fall over. Like I, I got, wow. I got nothing. I am, I am yeah. incredibly unstable. I'm like a, a, a toothpick that someone managed to actually balance on a flat surface, and like just what? I didn't expect that to stand up. Oh my god! All right, don't breathe. Down. You're like a. You're like a. You know, a toothpick when you take like marshmallows and you like take the toothpicks and you make a person out of the marshmallows, but you like yeah. try to stand them up and he's like, Ugh. yeah, more like, or like one of those like inflatable tubes with the arms in front of the car dealership. Now that, that's pretty much me. That's pretty much me. Throw one of those shirts on one of those tube things. And that's pretty much true. <laughs> walking around the office every day. <laughs> oh, uh, trotting, trotting, trotting. I have been known to skip from one, from one office yep, to another. Too. You do often yeah, do you, that. you make good time. Skipping is underrated. Yeah, I don't know. I got a lot. Just like Noodler's Cayenne. I got a little. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, company updates wise. So uh, co company updates, excuse me. Um, we've just had a lot of COVID disruptions. I know we talk about this all the time, blah, blah, blah. We're sick of it. But, um, you know, we're getting a little bit into the busier time of year as we approach into the fall and the holidays and all this type of stuff. Um, things do start to pick up with us a little bit. We're not going to try to do anything crazy this whole holiday season to make any drastic like flash sales or anything just because frankly supply chain issues and and labor shortages and stuff have made that a challenge um so we're going to try to offer just consistent service throughout the holidays um but we did make a recent change on our website setting the expectation of a two to three day uh shipping t time like two to three days before from your when your order is placed to when we can actually get it out the building plus the actual transit time in, in the shipping carrier. Um, normally we try to do one to two days and we can usually keep up with that pretty well, but it's been particularly difficult. You know, it's, it's nothing in particular, no one's fault. You know, we've had some, you know, successful product launches like the Inkvent calendars and stuff like that. When we get a mass of orders like that with a new product launch, it just, it holds up the works a little bit. Um, when we have more holidays, we have, um, you know, we had physical inventory that, that uh, last week that, um, you know, made things a little more challenging for us. No, not last week. That was two weeks ago. Sorry. Or was that last week? I can't remember. No, two weeks. That was last week. Last week, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. And then, um, uh, you know, also just like in this COVID life that we have, we have to not only have procedures in place for if people actually, you know, have you know the virus but you know with everybody's kids back in school, there's lots of sniffles, there's lots of allergies, there's lots of similar symptoms to things and we have to play it safe so there's lots of thankfully negative test results coming back but it you know we can't really have people coming into the building when there are symptoms to be had with them or their kids or other members of their family and that is just honestly it's just making things tough so you know we're trying to staff up we're trying to you know work around that as much as possible but it's just slowing things down a little bit in kind of an unpredictable way so we are working with that our team's working really 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 hard but you just continued grace patience is just really um, appreciated because it is just crazy times crazy times but we're all keeping our wits about us and making sure that we're keeping things safe and we're going to get things out as quick as possible but it's uh definitely not business as usual still all right Very true. Cool. if you want to order anything from anywhere for the holidays do it now get yeah started, and usps mail is, is not going to be faster than it was last year yeah usps has said that they're going to be slower fedex and ups they're expecting to be slower just because of the increased volume so it's going to be it's going to be a crazy holiday time so go ahead and order whatever it is from wherever ahead of time if you can cool all right drew what you got Absolutely. on your what you got on your desk 
a bunch of garbage, man. I've got so much stuff on my desk. I do have actually a, an interesting thing. Um, we've got samples in from Y Studio. Now, this is a pen company that uh, we are looking at, mm -hmm. and they make some interesting pens. There are the the ones we're looking at are faceted. Um, solid body metal mm -hmm. pens. Now they have they've had some pens on the market, uh, kind of like this. They've had like a small one that has a little loop with a lanyard optional thing on it, mm -hmm. and they've had a pen kind of like this, but it uh, sits in sort of a desk pen. Yeah, it's got like unit. a it's got a base to it. It's made to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this that. one is pretty new though. This one is called the Revolve Classic Fountain Pen, mm -hmm. and they come in a number of different colors. This one's the all brass one, which actually has some really cool copper um, inlays on the finials there, it's which cool. I think is pretty pretty sweet. Uh, and then they have other colors that are basically um, the uh, a solid color on all the flat parts of the facet faceted body and cap but then on the edges it uh, retains a brass look and they're actually supposed to weather uh, in such a way that the paint will wear off over time in certain areas becoming your own fountain pen so i think that's a pretty clever concept they're definitely meant to be pocket beat around pens and will develop a personality just kind of like raw leather does that um like you know galen has those kind of like just plain leather that don't have any sort of finishing to them mm -hmm. just because it's supposed to just take on uh you know bits of your life and you know be a complete expression of how you handle them which i think is pretty fascinating and unique uh, the nib is a Schmidt nib, so solid writer. I've been writing with it for uh, a couple mm -hmm. days now, and uh, yeah, German no complaints. Made. Yeah, German nib, Taiwanese pen. So mm -hmm. Y Studio is actually a Taiwanese pen, so um, it caps really well. It doesn't post, but um, yeah, so mm -hmm. far it's been a pretty fun thing to write with. Uh, the the uh, like I said, they've got other stuff around, even though this isn't new. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Let us know. Yeah, it seems but, like they have um, like that kind of that, that EDC, you know, everyday carry yeah. kind of vibe about their yeah. whole design, you know, aesthetic. Yeah, very well balanced, not like almost center. It's like right there in the, but it's it's a really well balanced pen. I, I nice. like it a lot. And it's, it, I've been fiddling with it the entire pen cast. Um, <laughs> nice. But uh, yeah, so that's that's been what I've been playing around with. Very cool. Yeah, I don't have much to say on my front. I've been, I've been trying to clean up a little bit. I have been working on, I've talked about in previous pen casts about how completely much of a disaster my personal situation is here at home, but um, it's getting better. I'm, we're cleaning up some of our personal spaces. My desk area is getting a little more in order. So for me, it's less about like what's on my desk, like playing with things. It's more about like what's off my desk, which so I'm <laughs> just getting random crap in order. Um, so that has been my concerted effort as I've had energy to do so. So I'm gonna continue on that front and try to get my life a little more in order. You know, it's kind of thing that like, the more I do, the more clutter tends to gather around me. And then I can usually tell when I'm not handling things as well because my physical clutter around me reaches a certain kind of breaking point and I'm like, okay, I probably need to like take some time off or need to mm. scale back my commitments a little bit because just physically the stuff around me is showing me how much I have packed into my life. So it's kind of handy when I can actually recognize that, but yeah. Yeah. So that's been that's a feature. Yeah. It's been, been a concerted effort of mine. Cool. All right. Well, that does it for this episode, number 18. So glad to have you all join us. If you uh, want to give us some feedback, please let us know in the comments. We love hearing from you. We absolutely love getting your feedback. Um, definitely check out gulaypens.com for lots of fountain pen, ink, paper, stuff that we've mentioned here in today's pencast, as well as others. Um, go ahead and subscribe to us, like, share, dislike, whatever. Just engage somehow because YouTube likes that and then they know that you're watching and paying attention and that you give a hoot about what we're doing. Um, if you want to email us and if you're listening to the audio version, you can check us out at pencast at gulaypens.com. And I have a little writing prompt for you today. Um, I'm going to ask you all to write about the oldest memory that you have from your childhood. This is more of a little personal journaling activity for you. The oldest memory that you have from your childhood. Jot that down. That'd be kind of cool. Share it with your posterity. It'd be kind of neat. That's all we got today. Thanks everybody for watching and right on.